So I cease to mail. One minute. So good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone. Thank you for joining us today in this event organized by the Human Rights um, Watch by HealthPage International and the NGO Committee on Aging Geneva with the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights and Age Platform Europe. My name is Monica Ferro. I'm the director of the Geneva office of UNFPA and I have the honor to be your moderator today. Today's timely discussion on human rights in older age towards the elimination of ageism and age discrimination is both a side event of the 48th session of the Human Rights Council and also the launch of a series of events to mark the International Day of Older Persons on the 1st of October. And today we also mark World Alzheimer's Day. With us, we have a distinguished panel of speakers. Some of them will be live, some of them will be on video recording, but it will offer us the opportunity to hear firsthand about the situation of older persons in different parts of the world, to exchange views and take stock of the recommendations of the report by the independent experts on the enjoyment of, of all human rights by older persons that was presented yesterday to the Human Rights Council. But before we start this very important conversation, let me take 30 seconds to some housekeeping information. We are live on webtv.un, uh, thanks to UNDESA. And this event has interpretation into Spanish and French. Please choose your language in the Zoom bar, the world icon. And we also have closed captation or speech to, um, to text and international sign language. And as I was saying, we have lined up for you a stellar and authoritative panel with the High Commissioner for Human Rights, Ms. Alba Shale, with Maria Conchita Fernandez Ramirez Arias from the Council of Sabios, Wise People in Colombia, with Adolf Ratzka, Independent Living Institute in Sweden, with Rosita Chit Laxan from the Confederation of Older Persons Association of the Philippines, Edgardo Cortes from Older Persons in Diversity from Argentina, Claudia Mahler, the independent expert on the enjoyment of all human rights by older persons, Alana Officer, the unit head for demographic change and healthy aging in WHO. And we, all, we also have some short videos by older persons from Canada, Jordan, Moldova, Togo, and Ukraine. And we also have with us Her Excellency Anita Pippen, the permanent representative of Slovenia to the UN and other international organizations in Geneva, who's also the co-chair of the group of friends who will give closing remarks. Please post questions to the speakers, either in the Q&A function on the bottom of your screen or on the chat. We will do our best to address them. And because we have uh, a lot of speakers and we want to be able to listen to them all with the, with the intention they deserve, I have the honor and the privilege to give the floor to uh, Michelle Bachelet, the High Commissioner for Human Rights, whose uh, voice, whose commitment and whose rich career serves as an inspiration and guidance for all of us. Madam High Commissioner, you have the floor. Thank you, Monica, excellencies, colleagues, and friends. I'm really pleased to join you in this, how Monica was saying, timely and crucial discussion. Um, we all have been speaking all these months how important has been that the COVID-19 pandemic has uncovered many weaknesses of our societies, bringing to the fore the need to correct the damage that is inflicted on all of us by structural inequalities and by discrimination. And it's all, it has also shone light on issues that have been long uh, been denied or neglected, such as ageism. Uh, the recent UN Global Report on Ageism has found that one in two people has prejudices against older people. Uh, ageism is so pervasive in our society that it goes largely unrecognized and unchallenged. It remains one of the major barriers to the full enjoyment by older persons of their human rights. Ageism and the resulting um, age discrimination have serious and far reaching consequences for health, well being, dignity, and rights, above all for older people, but with negative impacts that extend across all of society. 
Ageist stereotyping is all around us. For example, older people are often portrayed as uniformly frail and vulnerable, but in reality, the older population is an incredibly diverse group, perhaps the most diverse of all age groups. Older people frequently make irreplaceable contributions to their families, to their communities, as workers, caregivers, volunteers, and community leaders. They are bold, wise, and creative with deep knowledge of our societies and are often powerfully committing to addressing injustice. To combat ages, we must shift our mindsets and um, challenge the narrative of older people as frail, dependent, or vulnerable. To come back, uh, we, their voices, their perspective and expertise need to be incorporated in policy making, particularly where they are most affected. We also need to strengthen accountability for older people when their rights are violated. Considering the pervasiveness of ageism and our rapidly aging populations, it is striking that under the current international human rights framework, there's no explicit guarantee against being subjected to ageist discrimination. There is also no explicit obligation um, for states to take active measures to eliminate ageism and its discriminatory consequences. This is a very significant gap in the international human rights framework and its needs to be addressed. There should be a human rights treaty specifically focused on the rights of older people. As part of a strengthened international protection framework, we need a clear, tailored definition of what equality and non-discrimination uh, on the basis of older age means. The independent experts F a report to this council session provides us with very useful analysis and the policy recommendation in this respect. The UN Global Report on Ageism provides new evidence of the scale of ageism and the damages it inflicts. It makes clear that more work is needed to understand the roots of ageism and effective strategies to address it. And the UN Decade of Healthy Aging, which begins this year, is the perfect opportunity to get this work done. Excellencies, colleagues and friends, more inclusive, equitable and age-friendly societies will be more resilient sustainable, secure, and of course, fair. We need to strengthen our efforts, including under the council to advance older people's rights. I look forward to your thought. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Madam High Commissioner. Um, Thank you for setting the stage for this conversation. Your words resonate um, very clearly with us. Uh, when you say that ageism is so pervasive in our societies that it often goes uncharted and unchallenged. And I think the diversity, the intersectionality, but also um, the contribution of all the persons, you were saying bold, wise, creative, with a powerful knowledge of our societies, but also the need to set up proper accountability mechanisms that can address the human rights uh, realization and also um, violations of these human rights. They are uh, messages that I, that I think will echo very clearly with our audience, but also provide us with some food for thought as we, um, as we go along. We also know, High Commissioner, this is why we feel so honored that you could join us, how busy you are because there's a Human Rights Council session ongoing now. So um, we understand that you will not be able to stay with us for the whole session, but do feel free to interrupt us, to comment to, uh, on, on, on the statements or either to um, just to say goodbye. We are really grateful that you uh, took the time to share your voice and to join this, uh, this conversation. And now we will listen to diverse voices from all the persons as the High Commissioner uh, so wisely advised us. We will start with a clip of voices from all the, per uh, from all the people in Togo. And let me just add that this clip is a part of an ongoing global voice project for the UN Decade of Healthy Aging, as we've heard also, led by WHO's Demographic Change and Healthy Aging Unit with funding from the Public Health Agency of the Government of Canada. This, ex this um, clip that we are gonna see uh, is drawn from a longer 14 minute uh, film made by older people in the city of Kaplime, 
in Togo, facilitated by Insight Share in partnership with LPH International and the local NGO Unisol B. Les gens souffrent. À Palimé, on considère que Palimé est une belle ville et autres, mais quand vous rentrez, comme je suis dans la masse, les gens souffrent sérieusement, surtout les personnes âgées. Blamleka, <laughs> Il faut mener une petite enquête pour voir si réellement il y a des personnes âgées. Bon, connaître le nombre, voir la situation de chaque personne et voir comment intervenir. Mais l'intervention qui pouvait vraiment, vraiment réussir, c'est aider ces personnes à monter de petites activités rémunératrices de revenus. Bon, distribuer les vivres, c'est une bonne chose, mais ça c'est pour un petit temps. Cette personne âgée, si on peut lui, lui financer un petit fonds, tout juste pour mener de petites activités, et pouvoir supporter la famille, ce serait mieux. L'État en fait déjà, mais ça doit être complété par les associations ONG. Je ne sais pas si ailleurs en Afrique, euh, c'est mieux. Mais dans mon pays, je n'ai trouvé nulle part, dans aucun centre de santé, un service de gériatrie, gérontologie. Et la prise en charge de la santé des personnes âgées relève du domaine de l'État. Et je prierai les États de faire en sorte que des personnes qualifiées soient formées dans le domaine de la santé pour accompagner les personnes âgées en ces moments euh, précieux de leur vie. Peu Également penser au fait que en Afrique, par exemple, le meilleur endroit pour que les personnes terminent leur vie, ce n'est pas dans les, les centres ou bien les maisons de vieillesse. Ailleurs, ça marche, mais chez nous, en Afrique, les gens aiment bien rester dans leur maison. Et il est connu aussi que le meilleur cadre pour la bonne santé, pour le bien-être d'une personne âgée, c'est sa maison. Nothing about us without us and listening to the voices um, of the people of whose rights we are discussing, it's really um, an impressive contribution to this debate. And as I said, the, the project's complete voice videos will be available on the UN Decade for a Healthy Aging Knowledge Platform later this year. And we will see another clip of the project later on. I would like now to turn to uh, one of our panelists, Adolf. Um, he's the founder, is also the founding director emeritus of the Independent Living Institute in Sweden and advocate for persons with, with disabilities. Adolf, we just heard that in Togo, all the persons want to live at home. Um, what's your take on that? Is it different elsewhere? Join your voice to ours. Yeah, I don't think there's any difference. In my experience, people only move into residential institutions if they are forced to for lack of acceptable alternatives in the community. And I'll give you my story. I became disabled at the age of 17, 60 years ago. Since then, I've needed mechanical breathing aids, like the mask you see on my face, an electric wheelchair and the help for getting up in the morning going to the toilet, getting dressed, and so forth. The first five years after polio, I had to spend in hospitals 
and the residential institutions. I was medically stable, but my family was unable to do this work. And there were no support services in the community. In 1966, I managed to get out of the institution with the help of personal assistance. I won a scholarship that included money for hiring fellow students who worked for me as my personal assistants. And since 1966, I've lived in the community, worked as a researcher, started a family, got involved in disability advocacy. I've had a rich and rewarding life thanks to personal assistance. Without personal assistance, living in an institution, I would have died decades ago. Now at the age of 77, I still have a rich and rewarding life because I still have personal assistance. Since I got my disability before the age of 65, I'm eligible for direct payments for personal assistance from the Swedish social insurance. My payments cover the cost of 18 hours of personal assistance a day. But had I acquired my disability after the age of 65, I would get now five hours a day from the local government's community-based services instead. Five hours a day would not be nearly enough and my wife would have to help me a large part of the day. She'll be 70 soon. Imagine the pressure on my wife knowing I would be forced into an institution the day she no longer can work for me. At age 22, personal assistance got me out of institutions. At age 77, I worry about having to move back to an institution because a government commission recently suggested stopping direct payments for personal assistance to those over 65. But I'm still the same person. My needs, interests, and aspirations, they have not changed. Thank you. Thank you, Adolf, for your um, for sharing with us not only the, the your personal history but also the history of um, of, of a system the, of of creating of the creation of the mechanisms that allow you to um, to lead your rich and uh, and uh, and free and fulfilled life, as you were saying. And I hope this conversation and what you just shared with us. Um, adding to the voices of Togo can also sparkle a wider conversation or what needs to be done to, uh, to ensure that um, people can live the life they choose. Um, and but your, your, your statement is a very powerful one because it's one that comes out of experience uh, and you are a wonderful advocate for, for that. Thank you, Adolf. And uh, I will now turn to Maria Conchita Fernandez, uh, Fernanda Ramirez Arias. She's from the Council of Sabios um, from Colombia. Conchita, um, following on this conversation, we also saw in the video of Togo that all the persons do not have, they often do not have access to adequate income. Can you share with us your experience and what is the situation in your home country? Conchita, you have the floor. Muy buenos días para todos. Y muchas gracias por esta oportunidad de poder mostrar al mundo la condición de los derechos humanos de las mujeres mayores en mi país. Sin lugar a dudas, el edadismo es uno de los factores que más nos afecta, especialmente en los temas de salud, de educación y de vivienda. Pero hay uno en el que definitivamente los derechos son altamente vulnerados, y es el derecho a la dignidad cuando depende de la autonomía y de la autonomía económica. En Colombia, el 70% de las personas mayores de 60 años no tienen una pensión, 
no tienen un recurso que garantice su vida, que garantice su verdadera dignidad. De esta población, la mayor parte la conforman las mujeres, las mujeres mayores, más del 60% de la población mayor de Colombia son mujeres. Son mujeres que viven en condiciones de extrema vulnerabilidad porque sus derechos son ampliamente desconocidos. En el tema de la salud, aparentemente tenemos una gran cobertura, pero tenemos una gran fragilidad en el tema de la atención, que son dos cosas distintas. Más o menos el 90% de la población mayor está con cobertura de salud, pero una cosa es cuando llegan a solicitar atención, tanto en la atención médica como en la obtención de los medicamentos que son muy difíciles. De igual manera podemos señalar esa misma condición en los sectores urbanos y en los sectores rurales. La, la situación de la mujer en la ruralidad es muy apremiante, es muy difícil. En, la, en los sectores urbanos las mujeres están sometidas a ser parte de una economía informal y aparte de eso también tienen muchas responsabilidades en sus hogares. La pandemia trajo como consecuencia natural el aislamiento y también el hecho de que las personas debieron ir a sus casas a trabajar. Entonces en las casas estaban los padres trabajando, los hijos estudiando y fueron nuevamente las mujeres mayores las que tuvieron que encargarse de la economía y del desarrollo de la, del hogar. Entonces, podríamos decir que esos factores del edadismo de, disminuyen notablemente el derecho y el cumplimiento de los derechos, especialmente los factores económicos. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias, Conchita. Um, thank you so much. Um, your, your message um, focused on the, the human rights of other persons and also I, I really like how you framed it, the right to dignity and how you link it with, um, with the pension system, but also making the case um, to bring um, the conversation to older, to older women and the impact COVID has brought upon them, but also how it shed light on these many um, challenges, on these many discriminations that we are witnessing. And um, I would like now to move to Asia, to Rosita Chit Laksan. She's the president of the Confederation of Older Persons Association in the Philippines. While Ms. Chit is with us, um, she also pre-prepared uh, pre or pre-recorded a video and she was worried about problems of connectivity with the unstable weather. Um, so our question to Ms. Chit is, um, Amid the pandemic in the Philippines, there were more restrictions to all the person's rights to freedom of movement compared to the rest of the population. Can you tell us more about this? I think we have. During the first quarter of the COVID-19 pandemic, the Philippine government issued national guidelines restricting all older persons, healthy or with no comorbidities, those who are still working, living alone from going out of our house. There were also national guidelines which prohibited us from using public transportation and the train system of the country's capital. I've heard some stories of older persons who were not allowed to enter grocery stores public transport, not given a quarantine pass. Fortunately, the guidelines were eased after several weeks. However, more discrimination happens at the local level or with the implementers. Checkpoints officials stop older persons walking out outside their homes. Some were even arrested Security guards in grocery stores, pharmacies, and government buildings prevented older persons from entering the establishment. Of course, we appreciate our government's concern for our health and well-being, but 
restricting all older persons without any consultation with our sector is discriminatory. And the national guidelines are already discriminatory, but the implementers make it worse for the older persons. We were not consulted in any of these guidelines for something that is very important for us, our voices weren't heard. Recently, we heard stories of older persons worrying they might not be able to receive their social pension benefits unless they get vaccinated. Yes, we appreciate the government's effort in prioritizing our older persons to get vaccinated against COVID-19. However, getting vaccinated is an older person's personal choice. Why we would like all older persons to have the vaccine and get protected, threatening them is absolutely wrong. Instead of threatening them, why not implement programs or activities that aim to raise older persons, their carers or families' awareness on the importance of the vaccine. Thank you, Miss uh, Miss Chit, for uh, for your um, for your statement on on an issue that has been um, discussed um, several times here in Human Rights Council and in um, some of the uh, conversations we organized throughout last year on the impact of the pandemic on the rights of older persons but also on the impact of the response measures on, uh, on the rights of other persons. And, um, and this is um, um, a rally cry for participation. It, um, it was very clear that, uh, that older persons must have a seat at the table where the decisions that impact them, but also sometimes impact them in a disproportionate manner, it needs to be, um, it needs to be secured. And, and, and your voice was very important on this. And, um, and now um, let's travel uh, to Jordan. We have a short video from Mrs. Kawatar uh, Tabaz from Jordan. Well, we didn't have any technical hiccups. Um, now it was time. Uh, let's, um, but we'll try to come back to this video um, shortly after uh, our next speaker. And now um, I have the, the privilege to, uh, to give the floor to uh, uh, Umberto Edgardo Cortes. He's uh, from Older Persons in Diversity Argentina. He's, he, he's here with us. Edgardo, which is your perspective from Buenos Aires, Argentina on the conversation we are having? You have the floor. Buenos días a todas y todos. Bueno, quería contarles un poquito mi historia para, para ubicarlos este, en este pequeño recorrido. Eh, todo comenzó hace 31 años al saber que tenía el virus de inmunodeficiencia adquirida o VIH. En ese momento falleció quien era mi pareja y nos enfrentábamos a un virus sin tratamiento y al estigma y a la discriminación para aquellos que lo teníamos. La comunidad gay pasó a ser el chivo expiatorio y los homosexuales los culpables de la existencia del VIH. Esta situación de mucha crisis en mi vida personal la resuelvo saliendo hacia adelante y junto a mi condición de persona con VIH comienzo una militancia como parte de la comunidad LGBTIQ+, eh, y la visibilización en ese proceso fue una herramienta y una estrategia para empoderarme en forma personal y empoderar a otros y a otras. Los primeros tiempos significaron una, un gran desafío por entender lo que estaba en juego y lo que estaba en juego era nada más y nada menos que los derechos humanos de las personas. Esa primera tarea se fue transformando y pasó a ser de un tema personal e individual 
hacer un hecho colectivo, una acción colectiva. El derecho a la salud tomó el estatus de un hecho político trascendental. La organización y participación de las personas con VIH fue fundamental para la defensa de los servicios y para la creación de leyes en la República Argentina. Y bueno, como todas las cosas de la vida, llegaron los años, el pelo se volvió blanco y surgió la necesidad de mirar y acompañarme con las otras personas mayores. Como referente de mayores en la diversidad, divulgamos la realidad del colectivo, la invisibilidad de los mayores y nuestros derechos a una vejez digna. Esta etapa del curso de vida nos encuentra activos física y mentalmente para atender los derechos vulnerados de las personas mayores. Salud, vivienda, alimentos, educación, son parte de la agenda en la que la sociedad y el Estado debemos trabajar mancomunada y unidamente. Una convención internacional, en este momento tenemos una convención interamericana de protección a nuestros derechos y una convención internacional de protección a los derechos humanos de las personas mayores es un anhelo y un objetivo a trabajar en los próximos tiempos. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias a, a usted, Eduardo, Edgardo. Um, um, what, a, what an important um, uh, layer you brought to the conversation, the, um, the diversity, the intersectionality, and the need to have inclusive um, policies. And, and if, I, if I may add, um, it's, it's something that it's really critical for us um, in UNFPA, and we've been making the case of uh, unfolding or, or uncovering all the layers when we talk about human rights, as you were saying, when you talk about the right to health, but also all that it's all that leverages that right to health and what impends that right that right to health, and um, and how inspiring is your acknowledgement that you start from an individual perspective. It's about empowering yourself, and then the movement is created, and you are working for the collective. You are working for all rights for all people including the rights of all the persons. Thank you so much for your voice, but thank you mostly for your work and for your um, advocacy. And, um, and now, um, again, traveling uh, across the world, we now turn to Moldova. Uh, we wanted to hear different voices, and now we have a voice from Milim Emilia Beldiga. She's a volunteer from HelpAge from the district of uh, Resina. și sede Republica Moldova. În anumentarea anul vârstă, în Moldova, este o provocare zi de zi, fiindcă pensiile fiind mici nu acoperă cheltuielile oamenilor în vârstă, iar infrastructura la sate este dezvoltată slab. Cateluștul, canalizarea, drumurile bune și neavând acces la viață socială, cu aceste probleme se confruntă oamenii în iertate. Pandemia COVID-19 ne-a afectat enorm. N-având acces la serviciile medicale și fiind izolați în casă și suntem izolați și ne-având comunicare cu oamenii dragi. Politicile Moldovei ar trebui să fie orientate pentru ridicarea nivelului de trai la sate a oamenilor în, în vârstă, fiindcă ar trebui să fie informați toate drepturile pe care le au, care le vor ajuta în viața de zi cu zi. Thank you so much for um, for your statement and for your voice and for showing your commitment and also for providing us another insight on on the situation of all the persons um, across the world and i think we have now we are now in condition to share the video from jordan from uh, mrs kawatar uh, tabaza am i right yeah it's me kawatar tabaza min al ordan wa umri 61 an bahis ahyana inno fi tamiz لاني انا يعني بحب اطلع اتدرب اتعلم اسمع محاضرات اشي اللي استفيد فاحيانا بسمع طلطيش حكي 
ليش طالعة وليش نازلة وليش لابسة هيك وليش تضحكي هيك وليش تعملي هيك وبصيروا يعني بعد مرات برموا لك امثال انه بعد ما شاب ودوه على الكتاب وبعدين كل هذا انه ليش انه انت كبير بالعمر عيب تعمل هيك احيانا اه يعني بلاد برا بتطلع انه لما إيه صارت جائحة كورونا إيه حسينا انه في عندهم إيه نقص انه ما اهتموا بكبار السن ولا حجروهم اما في الاردن لما صارت الجائحة وزاد ازداد المرض اهتموا بكبار السن ولما صار عندهم الكورونا حجروهم وادوهم اللقاح واهتموا فيهم يعني من فئات تانية كمان انا رأيي التشريعات والقوانين بتلعب دور كبير تحسين حياة كبار السن أفضل إنها تتعدل أو تتغير أفضل إنها تتراجع بشكل مستمر Um, it's really um, the diversity of voices and the diversity of experiences that we wanted to share with you today. And, um, and this last uh, message from Jordan, also focusing on the role um, legislation and laws have in empowering and uh, securing the rights of other persons. It's, um, it's a message that resonates clearly here in, in Geneva, also during the Human Rights Council. And now um, we go to our second video from the voice project that, I, that we just saw in the beginning of, the, of our conversation. And this voice uh, is from, it's drawn from a 30 minute film made by indigenous first national elders from uh, Mantulin Island in Ontario, Canada. My name's Urban Majaki. I was asked to do discrimination, and I think it happens frequently in my community, native or non-native, especially when I slow down on the highway, see something wrong up ahead, or see an animal that's going to try and make go across. People will pass me and give me the finger. I think that's discrimination. Ageism does exist in our society. It's a global human rights issue. As a working individual, some people say to me, young people need work. But for me, I'm passing on my knowledge for the next generation. Being discriminated all the time, no matter where, even if I stand up on the aisle and I get groceries or something, some but they also pass me by then just moves on ahead of me. And I think that's discrimination. A lot of those are happening like that. Young people should be in contact with the grandparents, grandfathers, and the elders in our community. We need to get the youth involved in our community with the elders. We can show them how to live off the land, have a big garden, and to participate in our community hunts and to love the older people, because we do deserve it. Miigwech. And someone just wrote in the chat box that we are watching uh, a series of powerful and inspiring messages from uh, all over the world. And it's, it's indeed true. And this one was also um, very pertinent on, uh, on the need to end stigma and discrimination and on how pervasive discrimination is. As the um, High Commissioner was saying, it's so pervasive that we often um, don't even acknowledge it as a discrimination. And also um, a very strong call for the international, uh, intergenerational um, dialogue. And, um, and now, and, and we know and we acknowledge that all the persons, they do deserve um, the respect of their human rights. They need, they deserve empowerment and they need that all um, processes 
acknowledge the scope of ageism and, and discrimination. And we will now turn to our experts. We will now turn to Claudia Mahler, the UN uh, independent expert on the enjoyment of all human rights by other persons. Um, as you know, uh, Claudia, we all followed with great attention the interactive dialogue with you yesterday and what a rich discussion that was because your report um, brings a lot of food for thought and it brings multiple evidence for the discussion we are having here today. And I have to say that some of some parts of your report, I even think it was the first time we saw it uh, approached that way. So it's innovative, it's groundbreaking, and it's also very inspirational. And how do you relate, um, how do you see these voices relating to uh, your excellent report? Claudia Malin, you have yeah, thank you, Monica, for this kind introduction and for these kind words. I'm really honored to be with here, with all of you here today. And let me first begin with thanking the organizers for this great event, with, which is also a series of events to mark the International Day of Older Persons. And I think this is an opportunity for all of us to raise awareness to the human rights of older persons. And as you all heard, it was inspiring, these inspiring words, and we need to hear more insights from the experts. And all the persons are the experts themselves. They underscore their wishes and preferences, and we need to follow their recommendations and their call for the full enjoyment of their human rights. From my perspective, all their statements came with a clear message that ageism and age discrimination profoundly shaped the lived realities of older persons. The different voices from all the region also showed the diversity of the older persons group. From my perspective, we also have wit witnessed that there is not only a single layer which interferes with their enjoyment of their human rights. The intersectionality of all persons was very visible. Being older and a woman being older and having a disability, or living in a rural area or in poverty. These are all different stories. And we heard the stories about their lived realities, which gave evidence that ageism aggravates other forms of inequalities based on gender, disability, gender identity, and sexual orientation, ethnic origin, or other grants. To ensure that the older persons can enjoy their longer lives in dignity and equality, as I say in my report, it is really important to address the way older age intersects with all these forms of inequality, which creates serious barriers to participate actively in the civil so in society. At this stage, I would also like to thank WHO for their global report which is another opportunity to raise awareness on ageism. And I also love the idea what uh, Madame Bachelet already said. This is a starting point. We should use the UN, UN decade of healthy aging, aging. But I'm sure that Alana Officer from WHO will tell us more what specific measures or which will, which specific measures which are in place to combat ageism and age discriminations. Uh, the voices from, we heard the voices from all around the globe and they all gave us evidence that the humans by, human rights-based approach is needed to combat ageism and eliminate age discrimination. From my perspective, they really showed quite clearly that there are gaps which are very visible. There is the gap in the human rights framework that age does not, age is not mentioned as a grant of discrimination. And I think this causes the protection gap for older persons when it, in regard of age discrimination. As I stated in my report, countering ageism and eliminating age discrimination is the starting point for the full enjoyment of the human rights of older persons. There cannot be dignity and equality of the rights if the older persons continue to be viewed primarily as beneficiaries of care and support and not be seen as human rights holders. I think what, another key element which was ringing in my ear is the meaningful participation. It was mentioned in a couple of the voices and the videos we've seen we heard the evidence that nobody reached out to the older persons and included them 
in the ongoing discussions on social isolation or on other examples, how they should deal with the pandemic. The laws and measures did not give the older persons the same access as all the other age groups. It was mentioned that a lot of barriers, for example, access to information or the missing infrastructure, the missing health care for older persons is hard for them to enjoy their human rights. I think we also heard quite clearly in one of the videos that the older persons did not know where to go to complain because of different reasons. One was said medical treatment or sufficient support or social protection. I think there are many different things who hinder older persons to particip participate, for example, in the labor market. We heard of discriminatory laws and we also heard that there was a a very sophisticated paternalistic approach to stay at home measures for the safety. The treatment was not on equal footing with the others. And another aspect which was quite visible are the stereotypes. From my perspective, older persons themselves are the starting point because we just have seen the diversity in all the different videos and statement and they shared with us that they want to participate in the society they want to learn more they are interested in new topics and they are willing also to pass on their knowledge and wisdom but we also heard, heard quite clearly that older persons are put in a different box and we need to overcome these silos that for example um, the assistant is still, still there when you're getting older and you're used to the um, assistant and the, the personal assistant. And I think Alof made it quite clearly because of another year, he doesn't change and his needs also doesn't change. The intergenerational approach is also a very good example to start the conversation with the, with the younger generation. And as uh, Mr. Butler coined it in the 60s already, he coined the term ageism and said quite clearly, we all have a chance to get older and therefore we will be the future victims of ageism. Which matrix makes it from my perspective quite clear that we have to combat ageism right now and this would be an investment in all our future. From my perspective, states must accelerate the development of politics, laws and practical measures to combat all forms of discrimination and ageism. Because we all know the negative effects of ageism and age discrimination are evident and in many fears. I will finish with the with the reiteration of the statement we heard in the video from Canada, older persons really deserve it, that they can enjoy all the human rights. And this is why we need to act now. We need to join our forces and to combat ageism and eliminate age discrimination. One way to do is, is this, is to strengthen the human rights of older persons. And therefore we really must improve the current framework. As the high commissioner said, we really need a convention, an international binding comprehensive legal instrument, which gives all the states guidance how to better implement, implement the human rights of older persons. I want to thank all the older persons who vividly spoke out today and very loudly so the world heard their concerns, challenges with ageism and age discrimination. And I'm also grateful for their practical recommendations. I'm really looking forward to the discussion. And I also have a couple of questions, how we can improve the situation. And I very often hear that states need more pressure from the ground and you were all so, vivid and visible and loud. So please let us know how we can uh, further collaborate with you all. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Claudia. Um, and um, and as I was saying this, um, following the dialogue we had, um, we had with you yesterday, it really shows 
um, the evidence and um, and uh, and the advocacy messages and the recommendations that you that you have on the enjoyment of all rights um, by all the persons and 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 your intersectional approach how you showed that ageism and age discrimination intersect with all the other isms it's really um, an evidence of the diversity uh, that um, that prevents us from treating all the persons as a homogenous community with one claim or one one size fits all approach but it was also very clear the gaps that you've mentioned, the participation, the fact that uh, we need to strengthen the human rights of all the persons and the, the several avenues that we have to do that. And, um, and I think, and I thank you for uh, being so humble in, uh, in asking all of us, how can we improve the situation? And I think um, some ideas are already here, but we will hear more um, as, we, as we go forward. And now um, I have the honor to uh, pass the floor to uh, um, to our line officer. A few months ago, um, WHO, in partnership with UNFPA, the Office of the High Commission for Human Rights, and UNDESA, uh, we published the UN report on a UN global report on ageism. And uh, we have with us uh, a line officer. She's, as I've mentioned, the unit head, uh, demographic change and healthy aging in WHO, the unit that actually leads on this work. And I know that Alana will share with us um, her reaction to all the testimonies we have heard because she's very knowledgeable on all this process and she's always making us uh, go further and stronger. Alana, you have the floor. Thanks, Monica. It's great to be here. And thanks very much to all the organizers. It's really actually very difficult, I find, speaking after so many very powerful voices. Um, today's been an incredible opportunity to listen to the stories and perspectives of older people. We need more of these opportunities. Um, and I really want to acknowledge and thank everybody who has spoken today. Um, in listening, we learn what matters to people. So we have heard about things as basic as food and water, healthcare, education, work, income, personal assistance, and love. We have learned other things that matter, knowing where to go and how to seek help, and being able to continue to strengthen and build relationships with other generations. In listening to older people in all their diversity, in terms of gender, we've heard in terms of where they live and who they love, we can learn about the needs and rights and how they can be met, whether it be through training, as we've heard of healthcare providers, support for income generating activities, um, improved infrastructure, increased intergenerational contact, and just basic personal assistance that is sustained throughout somebody's life. Today is a very strong reminder, I find, that behind those demographic figures that we all love to quote so much, uh, that there is a human face, that there is a life, a story, there are insights, there are ideas, there is expertise and there are answers. And they are there for our seeking and uh, to guide us. And older people have to be central to the actions that concern them. And this is why one of the enablers of the UN Decade of Healthy Aging is about voice and meaningful engagement of older people. We know that the process of change ignites when somebody decides to listen. And everybody here today is part of that process of listening. But why do we not listen? So ageism is one reason. The High Commissioner spoke and Monica spoke about the UN Global Report on Ageism. And that it said that every second person in the world is believed to hold ageist attitudes towards older people. If half the world already has negative thoughts and feelings towards older people, when will they be given the opportunity to speak, 
and when will their voices be heard? Listening is a technical and a moral imperative. We've heard, and Claudia said it very strongly, older people are experts on their situation. Older people have the right to determine their own lives. Participatory approaches, like we saw today in the videos, um, help older people communicate their lived experience, identify solutions they think will work to their challenges, and recognize that older people and their communities are agents of change. These voices also provide us with the knowledge that can be used for policy making and practice. We have heard that ageism towards older people is incredibly prevalent. It is unrecognized, it is unchallenged, and has incredibly detrimental and far-reaching consequences for people's health, physical and mental, for their social well-being, for our economies, and for our societies as a whole. But I think one of the things that excites me in terms of the, the global report on ageism is that change is possible. And it outlines three strategies that work to prevent and respond to ageism. One of those is around promoting intergenerational contact. It can really help reduce prejudice between generations and reduce stereotypes. We need education. It's the second intervention that works. It can increase empathy and dispel misconceptions. And as Claudia spoke so strongly to, we need policies and laws at national and global level and we need a legally binding convention on the rights of older persons. The evidence is clear. We all need, all of us here and everybody that you know and beyond needs to stand up for a world without ageism. Join us in the global campaign to combat ageism and together we can create a world for all ages. I invite you from the beginning, from the 1st of October, to join the campaign Ageism Across the Ages uh, to raise awareness and generate action. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Alana. Thank you for your commitment. Thank you for the wonderful work um, with, the, with the global report that we are probably part of. And, uh, and there's more to come, we, we know that. But thank you for uh, bringing uh, the importance of the intergenerational dialogue, also the importance of talking about um, this um, discrimination that often goes um, unreported, that even goes unacknowledged. So um, this was um, um, a very powerful uh, message as you've gone, as you've grown as used to uh, being such a champion for this for these rights. And now I have the difficult challenge of trying to. Um, raise some of the questions. We got many in the chat box through other, through other channels. And what I'm gonna do now to try to, um, to give everyone the right to, or the, the chance to, to answer. So we got a, a couple of very interesting questions. There's one on COVID and inequalities and also highlighting that the world, as the world shift to digital and technology, um, that all the persons were even more mar marginalized. If um, if you have any recommendations, uh, actually the question goes specifically to um, to Claudia, to the independent experts on how to make um, to make more inclusive policies, um, making sure that the digital divide doesn't grow uh, doesn't grow even more. And we also have a question on um, what what would be the best the best approach to protecting all the persons against the risk of uh, contracting COVID without um, unequally restricting their rights and freedoms. And another one with, um, do you have more examples how ageism intersects with other isms? So if you don't mind, I'm gonna start by um, Claudia, and then I'm gonna pass the floor to our uh, speakers, to our other speakers, and ask them to leave us also a final message. What do you want us to leave this conversation uh, thinking about what what is the main message, Claudia? You please 
you, you go yeah. ahead first. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Monica. I think the digital divide, uh, which we have seen, especially through COVID crisis, when the social isolation was in place, showed us that there are more barriers than that we were thinking in the first place. But to be honest, you know, I, I just would say that the participation, the meaningful participation of older persons would be the first step to bring them to the discussion, to the conversations. And I'm sure that all our participants here and at the panel would also have something to say about the digital divide or if it is good enough that they get support to do it. We see they are here. So they are techies themselves and I'm sure they know how we could improve the situation but what was asked is that um, the politicians need to take this into account, need to take into account that maybe support is needed in the first place, and then ensure that the infrastructure is there as well. Thank you, Monica. And I don't know, should I give my takeaway already or later on? Go ahead. Okay. You start the role. <laughs> Okay, then my takeaway is that we need to hear more older persons in our discussion because they are the experts and they know exactly where we need to improve the system. Thank you. Thank you so much, Claudia. And now by no specific order, but the order you all appear in my screen, I'm gonna start with uh, Ms. Chit. Disappears on my screen. So, I'm going to, oh, there she is. She's muted. Okay. Ms. Chit, while, while you work on unmuting yourself, I'm going to now Pass the floor to Edgardo, por favor. Your final messages to us. Bueno, agradeciendo, primero agradeciendo eh, la posibilidad de la participación y creo que, bueno, entre todas las cuestiones que hay que resolver, una muy importante es considerarnos a las personas mayores eh, sujetos políticos sujetos activos políticos, porque como, como decía Claudia, nuestra palabra, nuestra experiencia es fundamental para eh, resolver las cuestiones que tienen que ver con nuestra población este, eh, en particular y con la sociedad en general, porque nosotros estamos insertos y somos este, una, parte, una parte esencial de nuestras familias y, y de toda la sociedad en la que, a la que pertenecemos. Simplemente este, decir que en Argentina, bueno, hay el futuro, pensando en el futuro, en Argentina estamos eh, impulsando una nueva ley de VIH, este, tuberculosis e infecciones de transmisión sexual, que es un tema muy importante y muy negado junto a la invisibilización de, de la población, el tema del VIH en las personas mayores. Así que eh, estamos trabajando allí, trabajando también en información y comprensión para eliminar el estigma y la discriminación, uno de cada dos personas este, lo considera así, y fundamentalmente trabajar para la cura del VIH. Creemos que la sociedad y el Estado deben seguir trabajando en forma sólida y mancomunada por una vejez digna y saludable. Muchísimas gracias. Y thank you. Um, Adolf, you are my next speaker. Great. Yeah. I have three points. Uh, we need to develop support services in the community for the whole life cycle. Services that are based on need, not on diagnosis, on the person's preferences, not on the person's age. No one should need to become a burden on the family. No one should need to move into an institution. Second, we need to increase the supply of barrier-free housing. Nobody should need to move into an institution for lack of accessible and affordable housing in the community. 
And thirdly, we need to phase out residential institutions where we risk neglect, abuse, and even death during pandemics. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, thank you. Um, points well taken. Um, and thank you so much for, for sharing with us. And now, Maria Conchita, te puedo pasar la palabra? Sí, gracias. Muchas gracias. Desde, desde mi experiencia en el Consejo de Sabios, a través del cual representamos a un millón cien mil personas en la ciudad de Bogotá, Hemos aprendido que la participación es definitiva. Hemos aprendido que si no nos empoderaron, nosotros debíamos empoderarnos. Y con el Consejo de Sabios conseguimos hace dos años la aprobación de la Convención Interamericana de los Derechos Humanos, convertida hoy en ley en nuestro país. Sin embargo, esa participación tiene que estar acompañada de las entidades nacionales y de las entidades internacionales. Por eso creo que este evento es realmente algo maravilloso, porque le están diciendo a las personas mayores, ustedes existen, ustedes son importantes. El mundo se ha construido sobre su experiencia, sobre su conocimiento y sobre su sabiduría. Entonces creo que lo que las personas mayores necesitamos lograr, lo podemos hacer a través de una participación permanente, constante, empoderada, si ustedes nos ayudan a continuar haciéndolo y a que en nuestros países se desarrolle políticas de apoyo mucho más fuertes para las personas mayores. Gracias. Thank you for your for your messages. Um, that was the goal of the panel <laughs> to give you voice to um, to, um, to to showcase your experiences and in, in your views. And now, Ms. Chita, do we do we have Aha. Thank you, sir. It's a pity. I heard tell me a thing. Um, um, ageism or age based discrimination happens everywhere and anytime. Anyone, not just older person like me, can or may experience this kind of discrimination. So, ageism is happening in the COVID 19 pandemic. Actually, the pandemic exposes how ageism is ingrained throughout society. So, there must be a consultation with the representatives of our older persons' organization from different sectors, and their needs must be considered in the planning of programs for how older persons can be protected against. COVID-19. Thank you very much, Monica. No, we thank you for uh, joining us and, and, and joining your expertise and your, um, and your passion to this panel. And now last but not least, Alana, sorry to leave you for last again, but you are on the bottom of my screen, Alana. <laughs> no worries, Monica. Thanks and uh, thanks to everybody. So takeaways for me is, uh, we need to challenge our own bias around uh, age, yeah? We need to listen to, so that we are also all part of the solution. We need to listen to the voices of older people and meaningfully, and I stress that word meaningfully, engage older people on all issues that concern them. Um, uh, there are huge benefits of reducing ageism and discrimination based on age, uh, whether it be on health participation, you know, in our economies. Uh, we need to invest in what works, so intergenerational contact, educational interventions, and policy and law, and that everyone has a role to play. Um, and uh, on that note, on the 1st of October, we're gonna have a lot of materials that you can use. They're not branded by anybody. They're there for you to use to be part of the solution. And so we invite everybody to engage in the process of creating a world for all ages and reducing ageism against older persons. Thanks, Monica. Thank you so much. Thank you all. And we couldn't, um, we couldn't close with a better uh, person than um, the ambassador, Anita Pipan. Your Excellency, um, thank you so much for joining us on this conversation. We know that it's something very close to your heart and to, uh, and to your mission. 
and um, we have the privilege to have you with us and ask you to provide some uh, closing remarks. For those of you who weren't here when the panel started, uh, Ambassador Anita Pittman, she's the permanent representative of Slovenia to the UN and other international organizations in Geneva, and she's also the co-chair of the Group of Friends. Ambassador, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Mo uh, Monica. Dear friends, uh, dear colleagues, as a recently appointed ambassador of Slovenia to the UN in Geneva, I'm delighted to take part in today's uh, event. As you know, my country has uh, been actively advocating for a greater protection of rights of older persons around the world for more than um, a decade. And I, I am extremely um, honored to be able to, to listen to the insightful voices and the diverse voices um, from our panelists during the debate today. Uh, we are also um, very grateful for the contributions of all the non-governmental organizations and other so, um, civil society actors, as well as the UN system, which has uh, in the last year provided member states with many really useful reports. All this work uh, enabled us, together with Argentina and Brazil, to start negotiating the very first substantive resolution on the rights of older persons, which focuses on the theme that we are addressing today, ageism and age-based uh, discrimination. Um, if I may share some substance of the draft resolution with you, the resolution seeks to recognize challenges related to the enjoyment of different rights of older persons. It calls states to prohibit all forms of discrimination of older persons and take measures to prevent ageism and age-based discrimination. We have heard the High Commissioner at the beginning of this um, uh, event calling for international legal instrument on protection on, of the rights of older persons and what the core group, Slovenia, Argentina, and Brazil is trying to do with the resolution. We are trying also to mandate a report which would examine the normative standards in international law, the adequacy of the international human rights system and implementation mechanisms for the promotion and protect, the protection of human rights of older persons. We are also trying to mandate Office of the High Commissioner to convene two multi-stakeholders meetings where these issues could be discussed. So far, the, in the negotiations that we are um, leading, uh, we received very positive feedback by, by member states. Um, uh, many have stressed their interest in the subject matter. And as, as always, of course, the path to the adoption of the resolution uh, will, will take some more dialogue and, and engagement. Uh, we are also hoping that these negotiations at the Human Rights Council, this process at the Human Rights Council and events like today's will empower or even embolden our colleagues in New York, the missions at the United Nations in New York who are working on the promotion of rights of older persons within the open-ended working group, hopefully to move this process forward together. I would like um, to, to finish by uh, expressing my, my conviction that we are stronger together, different stakeholders on this important agenda. And as one of the panelists said, I too believe that change is possible. Thank you very much, Monica, for this um, opportunity. Thank you so much, Ambassador, and uh, welcome to Geneva. And uh, um, we'll make sure that uh, we work closely with you on this agenda, but on many others. But mainly, thank you for your championship on this and for your very strong message, message around um, change being possible. And, um, and we really count on your support for that. And thank you all. I, I don't want to leave without mentioning that uh, there's an event um, to kick off a regional conversation about ageism 
that is actually led by uh, our regional office in Eastern Europe, Central Asia, uh, in ECARO. And it's going to be on next Monday, the 27th September at 10 a.m. Please see the link um, to register. Also, we saw um, a couple of asks for the videos, for the uh, reports, and I think that uh, you, all of you are going to get it. But to end, the next very, very short video is a preview of next week's dialogue um, that I was just referring to. It's a clip from a TikTok campaign. Let us change the narrative together. Can we play the video? Thank you so much for this. And um, please go and check the other contents. There are some pretty cool uh, videos and some campaigns that are, I would say, really groundbreaking. But um, mostly, thank you all for being here with us today. Um, there's an old African proverb that I really like that says, if you want to get somewhere fast, you should travel alone. But if you want to reach far, you should travel with company. And this is a journey, as, um, as we've heard today. And we couldn't ask for better company than all of you who have joined us today. So now go share what you've learned, what has inspired you. And we had many inspiring moments. But I have to thank again the organizers, the co-sponsors, the speakers, the interpreters, and all those of you who took time out of their busy agenda to, share, to be with us today. And we'll see you soon. Thank you so much.